Hello and welcome back to my channel. Today we will be talking about BERT. First I'll explain how BERT works and how is it different from GPT, for example, using my slides. We will also briefly discuss the paper itself and show some results from there. I will show a code for a Jupyter notebook to do some BERT fine-tuning. We will fine-tune uh, BERT for question answering. Then we'll dig into the code of the BERT itself, the implementation from Hugging Face. Uh, so we'll look at the actual um, inference code for the model, the attention layer, all the way down to matrix multiplications within the um, multi-head attention. And finally, we'll take a look at a small example of how pre-training could be done, again, from Hugging Face, uh, on how to train uh, BERT on mask language modeling task. So to understand what is happening in the video, uh, I suppose that you know some deep learning fundamentals such as backprop, residuals, patch norm, and also you know how transformers work and multi-head attention. So we will not be digging into too much detail about that. Also, all the code that I'll show today will be in PyTorch, so it would be nice to know that. Okay, so let's start with what is BERT. Uh, a little bit of history once again. Uh, so in 2017, in the paper called Attention is All You Need, which is, as far as I know, the most um, cited paper of, of the decade, at least, uh, and in literature, it's usually just referred as Vaslani et al., it basically introduced the transformer architecture. Since then, it basically became the, the best architecture we know right now for text, for audio, video, uh, images, uh, pretty much everything. Uh, however, that paper itself was quite specific in the task that they tried to apply to. They only talked about uh, machine translation, and they basically trained this uh, transformer model on the so-called parallel data set of English, and English text and German translation, and demonstrated that it is indeed working better than everything else we've known before. Then roughly a year later, a paper introducing GPT-1 by OpenAI on top of that showed that you can stop thinking about all these different targets for different tasks and instead just focus on modeling language. So this is the origin of language models. So they, what they did was basically create a giant data set of just text from Wikipedia, from the internet, from books, and learned uh, and trained the model to generate next token. The interesting thing that I found out was that by just doing that, by just predicting what comes next, the model also learns um, a lot of useful knowledge, including translation, I don't know, physics, programming, all of that, without having to explicitly code it into the model or explicitly find relevant data sets. You just train on a huge bunch of text and then you solve those tasks automatically. And then slightly later that year, BERT comes up. Um, so the main difference of BERT is the bi-directional attention. So it's basically, uh, if we compare that to GPT, which used the so-called causal attention. Um, so when reading text, when trying to understand the meaning of a specific word, um, with causal attention, you are only allowed to attend to elements that come before you. And that's sometimes referred to as left context, um, which might be a bit too restrictive. So if, if, you don't, if you're not that good at English, you might stop here and think like, hey, what does this word even mean? And so in BERT, we have full attention that is allowed to look to the left as well as to the right. And so now you look at this word, you see that of unicorns comes later. And you immediately assume that it is some sort of group or um, crowd. So that's what herd is. So here is the uh, original paper for BERT. Um, basically, this B here stands from, for bidirectional. So this is the main difference of BERT to uh, other models. Uh, and they explain this bidirectionality as condition on both left and right context, which basically increases the amount of data available for the model on when processing every specific token. And then slightly below here, we have some um, numbers of, of the actual measurements of quality of 
expert model as compared to OpenAI's GPT, for example, or models that came before that uh, on a language understanding set of data sets called Blue. And so we can see here that GPT-1 um, at its time, or should we look at the average instead? So GPT-1, despite not using any specific data sets, despite not injecting the knowledge into the model itself and just pre-training on a huge corpus of text, it basically beat everything else that came before that. Uh, so it uh, demonstrated that this approach is uh, the right one. Uh, nevertheless, uh, if you look at BERT now, so it's much better. And um, so this BERT base uh, has roughly the same number of parameters and computational complexity as OpenAI's GPT. And we can see just how much better it is in terms of like pure accuracy. And then they also try to scale it up a little bit um, by X3, I suppose, uh, creating a model called BERT, BERT large. And they show that, you know, you can scale it further. So if you, if you create even bigger model, the quality improves even further. So here is another um, way to look at this, right? So uh, if we just look at model sizes, so BERT base, GPT-1 have something like 110 million parameters. And it's, it's a lot. It's much bigger than previous models like dense neural networks, like maybe Exaboost and, and so on. So you do need a GPU to actually use that or train that. But at least they comfortably fit on one GPU. So you can perform in inference on your laptop. Uh, it's relatively easy in the cloud. Uh, and it's relatively cheap. So BERT large, three times bigger might still feed into the GPU, especially the modern GPUs in 2024. GPT-2, 1.5 billion, that's now 10 times bigger. Um, I've also managed to uh, perform inference with maybe extremely small batch sizes on, on a single GPU. And then GPT-3, the text generation model, is already 100 times better. And that's GPT-3. It's not even GPT-3.5. And that basically creates a lot of challenges in how you perform training, how you perform inference, because it's now not enough to just um, set up a GPU or even a lot of GPUs on one host. You have to think about multi-host and how do you connect them. So it's a completely different challenging engineering problem now. And then GPT-4, it's never really officially announced how big it is, uh, but people estimate it to be at least 1 trillion, so 10 times bigger than the previous one. Uh, and so that requires basically a huge computational cluster just to run. So, uh, and, and, and these models are generative, right? So they generate next token. They can talk to us. In contrast, BERT, uh, by being bidirectional, basically is not able to talk because, you know, when, when you use the left context as well as the right context, you basically are not able to train for next token prediction because you're always looking ahead. And this is not how you can do it in generation. So it will basically suck uh, generation. Uh, so what we can do instead is we can get out more old school predictions out of the model, like for classification, regression, basically getting out like a single number out of the model instead of having it talk to us. The good thing about this approach is that you can get really good results on specific tasks um, without having to rely on like this incredibly complex and expensive infrastructure for multi-host, multi-GPU inference. So BERTs right now, they are used um, quite extensively, the, like the original BERT or variations of that one, to solve real NLP tasks when you cannot afford to call ChatGPT, for example. So to do search, when you have a query, you have a document, you have to understand how much they match, or to do semantic analysis of text, like is, is it a positive review, negative review, uh, all stuff like that, when you need to do that on um, a huge number of texts, and you can't afford to just call OpenAI API on every one of them, that's when you use BERT. Now let's talk about how do you pre-train BERT. So in, in GPT-1, GPT-2, we had next token prediction, which is the language modeling task. That is the thing that allows the model to just train on a huge bunch of text and get some useful knowledge out of it. Now with 
bidirectional attention, we can't really do that. We can't predict next token. So what we instead can do is the so-called mask language modeling. So um, it's actually quite similar to just next token prediction. But now instead of always predicting basically the next token in a, se in a sequence, the, the last token in, in a text and so on, you are basically replacing uh, random parts of tokens with a special mask token. And then you tell the model to restore what originally was there. So this is how it looks like from the architecture standpoint. So once again, we have some text as an input with some tokens replaced with this mask token. Um, in, in reality, we also have a batch of texts. Then we pass them on through the tokenizer to get the actual token IDs instead of uh, the raw text. Um, we pass that as a sequence into the transformer. We also add uh, positional encoding to that so that the position information is still there. Then the output of the transformer is typically the same size, the shape as the input. Uh, and so you can roughly say that this token corresponds to this uh, output and so on. And so some of them do correspond to the initial tokens that were masked. And we connect them to the loss saying that these were the words that we were supposed to restore. Um, and we just perform simple cross-entropy loss. So, so now each token output is basically an embedding. We project that, that down uh, using a dense layer or a set of dense layers. We project that to the actual probability predictions for each token. And then we pass these probability predictions as well as the um, original ground truth token that we needed to predict. We pass that to cross-entropy loss. So this is like the replacement for um, next token prediction, which is also basically doing uh, language modeling. Another target that can be used for pre-training is called next sentence prediction. So um, this is an example of that. So let's say we have a sentence from, from a text in shock and finding, blah, 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 discovered herd of unicorns. And then we have a second sentence that we took as the next sentence of the same text. Um, and we assign a label of true to that. So we say that this indeed was a um, next sentence in a text. And then we can also create a negative example by just taking some random sentence from our entire data set. And so we can see that these two are now completely not connected. Uh, and so we can say that it's a negative and we can train the model to distinguish real continuations of text that we took from, from real text to this randomly assigned pairs. Uh, and to do that, um, we will need some architectural changes. So first of all, we have this CLS token that we explicitly add to every example that we pass into the model. Um, and we need it as this um, sentence level or text level output, right? So basically, if, if we look at this input sequence, uh, and the output sequence that corresponds to that. Uh, these guys, these tokens are all corresponding to some piece of text. And so if you need prediction that is not really uh, specific to a word or a token, but instead that corresponds to something for the entire text at large, you need this extra token to get the output out of basically. And there's one of two ways of doing this. One way is to use something like average pooling where you don't have a specified token and you just take out all the outputs and average them all out, for example. Um, alternatively, we can use this CLS token, and this is what is used in the original BERT in the original paper. Um, in addition, since we do have two sentences now, two pieces of text, we want to explicitly tell the model uh, which one is first, which one is second. Um, so for example, like. Uh, how will the model know where the first sentence stops and the second one starts? Um, to do that, we use this another special token called SEP token, separation token. Um, and in, in the code for the BERT itself, when adding position embedding, we will also have this special segment embedding, which will basically say that these uh, this first sentence has segment ID of zero, 
and then the second sentence has segment ID of one. Um, and the rest will work similar to position embedding. So we'll take this zero index and one index, we will look up some sort of trainable embedding out of that, and then we'll just add that to uh, content tokens and to the position embedding. Uh, and so we need that to more explicitly tell BERT which sentence was first and second. And that helps in a lot of tasks. So for example, search. You might be given a text query and a title of a document. And so you tell the model to find out how relevant this document is to this search query. Um, if you don't use SEP token, if you don't use the segment embedding, like a GPT-1, for example, would do, you'd ba you basically leave it to the model to guess which one is first and like which one is the question, which one is the answer. Or maybe you would ha insert special um, pieces of text to explicitly tell it where this text interface that, you know, this was the question, this was the answer. Here we are encoding that into the input itself. Um, which I believe should work better, although it is more limiting in some sense. So this is what is typically used in BERT models. Uh, so let's recap like every change in BERT as compared to GPT-1, for example. So we have masked language modeling, which is um, replacement for classical next token prediction that aims to pre-train on, on a huge corpus of text and get the uh, important information out of it and encode that into the model weights, basically. We have next sentence prediction, which uh, helps in training, and that's arguable, to be honest. So uh, recent papers like Roberta actually disproved that and showed that uh, in some, um, sometimes during training, uh, depending on data set size and parameters, uh, you might not actually need next sentence prediction target, but nevertheless, um, it forces the model to learn representation for an entire sentence or segment of text. So if, if next token prediction or uh, masked language modeling, they can be all local by because you, you just need to restore this one word. And it might be enough to just look at small context around that word to um, understand what the word is. And so for next sentence prediction, or for question answering or for search, you might want to look at larger chunks of text and to assign some sort of meaning to the entire text, not just to every localized token. And so that's what next sentence prediction uh, task helps to do. Um, we have segment embeddings, which basically help the model to understand contextual differences between two sentences in, in cases when we solve like answering, uh, question answering problems, like we have a text and we have a question and we want to answer that question using information from the text. And so you'd have this two different texts, like the text itself and the question or search when you have a query and you have a document and so on. So in all of these, it's useful to have segment embeddings to help the model distinguish between these types of texts. We also have CLS token, which is a placeholder for output for the entire text, not just for every specific token. And that will typically be used when we are solving classification problem or regression problem, something like text search or um, semantic analysis or something like that. Now let's discuss BERT fine tuning. So with fine tuning, uh, I would say the primary challenge is that, again, we don't have a model that generates text, so we can just you know, modify the sort of output we expect with prompts. Instead, every new task that we have to deal with, we actually change architecture of the model slightly. So if we have a model that is able to do mask language prediction, and we want to have a model that classifies positive and negative comments. Although the knowledge the model has is useful, the actual output we get out of the model is completely useless if, if you have MLM and you want to do um, so classification of texts. And so you would need to have some sort of fine tuning. You would need to have slightly different architecture replacing the uh, prediction heads that uh, come on top of the transformer. You would need to have some sort of fine tuning data set uh, to actually make the model output what you want. Um, let's 
talk a little bit about the glue data set. So it's a set of NLP tasks that are used extensively in different papers like GPT, like BERT, like the one we've uh, seen uh, earlier uh, to basically compare the models. Um, and so glue is a task set. So they have a bunch of tasks. All of them would look something like this. So this one is for grammatic acceptability. So we have an example of the professor talked us into a stupor, and that is a grammatically correct uh, sentence, or the professor talked us, that is not grammatically correct. So this specific task is basically binary classification. So we want um, zero or one coming out of the model. Here's another example of a Stanford sentiment tree bank, which is for movie reviews. So here we see really just part of a review, I think, with his usual intelligence and subtlety. So here, you know, since the overall connotation of the review seems to be positive, we assume that the review itself was positive. And here, Disney again ransacks its archives for a quick bug sequel. So here we can see that, you know, they the review sort of assumes that, um, uh, you know, Disney is doing that for money, so quality is probably not that good. So it's a negative review. Um, this is a slightly different one, the paraphrase corpus. So here we have basically two examples of texts. Amorosi accused his brother, whom he called the witness, of deliberately distorting the evidence. Referring to him only as the witness, Amorosi accused his brother of deliberately distorting his evidence. So you can see here that it's quite a complex example. You need to really read into it to understand what's happening. But here, in this particular case, we see that these two sentences are telling the same things. So it's a paraphrase. And then here we have slightly different ones. So USAPA owned, here we have 2.5 billion. Here we have 1.5 billion. So although they do look similar, it's not a paraphrase because the actual information contained in sentences is different. Um, here is the one for regression, um, where you have two sentences um, and you need to um, predict how similar they are. So a plane is taken off and an airplane is taken off. Completely similar, basically the same thing. A man is playing a large flute, a man is playing a flute. Slightly different, you lost the detail here, but overall the meaning is still quite similar. A man is playing a guitar. A girl is playing a guitar. So these um, labels come from uh, human assessors. So basically, they consider that you know the man changing to a girl is much more important detail than if flu flute is large or not. And then a man is smoking and a man is skating. Completely different things. So it's completely not similar text. Uh, and here is one that is particularly inter interesting. So squad question answering. So here we have a bunch of text, which is basically the context, uh, following the disbanding on blah, 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 blah. Um, her marriage influenced Beyonce to do this, which won her record setting six Grammy Awards. And then we have the question, who set the record for Grammys, how many did Beyonce win? And then the answer, um, and the answer is six, and it's contained right here in the text. Important thing here is that you know, we have the model that is not able to generate text, so we do not expect it to just print out six. Moreover, even if we did, it will be really hard to um, assess the accuracy of that because you know, if, if the model is able to output text in, in free form, like we would expect from a pupil, for example, how do you tell if it's correct or not? So what, it, what if the answer is correct, but it is rephrased a little bit? So you cannot directly match it to what was expected. Um, so what we do instead is we always ask the model to find the answer directly in text. And we also have questions uh, specific for that. So all the questions, they're not open-ended. They actually expect you to find the answer right in the text. And so uh, we always have this um, index of, of start of the answer and um, the length, basically, to say that here, yeah, the ground truth is just the index within the original text where the answer is contained. So to sum up, everything we've seen so far, they are relatively challenging tasks for old school models that don't really, like if, if we look at, uh, I don't know, at this one, for example, um, 
it's it's not something you can just code down in Python or maybe solve by looking at frequencies of words and so on. You really need to understand the sentence structure to answer a task like that. Um, all of them require slightly different outputs. So sometimes it's binary classification. Um, sometimes you'd have two sentences. And so it's useful to have segment embeddings to answer this. Sometimes you'd have uh, regression. So you output a number from 0 to 5. Um, sometimes you have this like question answering where the output is basically index start and index end of the correct answer. Um, and so this is the one we'll focus on because I think this is the most interesting. So now let's look at the actual code and how to fine tune that for question answering. So this is how the architecture of the model will look like. So we pass in the question as an input. Um, we add CLS token, uh, then the SEP token to signify that the question has ended and now follows the context for the question, um, which will contain the actual text from which we need to extract the answer. Um, then we do, like, this part is pretty much similar to pre-training. So we tokenize, we add position embedding, segment embeddings, pass that through our encoder with the generational attention mask, get out the sequence output. Um, it's actually of the same shape as input. I just drawed it a little bit different to um, fit everything on the slide. Um, and then we project that to the actual probability prediction. And so every token will predict probability of this specific token to be the start of the answer and the end of the answer. And then we have the ground truth. And so the ground truth has one start and one end. And we basically will see which one was correct, connect that to, to the ground truth, and then again, compute the binary cross-entropy loss. So um, here's the Jupyter notebook that actually does that. So here we mostly use the Hugging Face libraries. So datasets is from Hugging Face, transformers is from Hugging Face. So like this, we can just load the dataset. Uh, the name for that is squad. Uh, and so the this is like an example of how that looks like. So the dataset is actually like a dictionary with train, validate, and test already being part of that. So you can basically just refer to the train dataset as row data sets at train, and then you just get an example by index. And so we can see here that the context contains quite a bunch of text. Um, and the data set actually has several questions for the same text. Um, then the question, to whom did the Virgin Mary allegedly appear in uh, Lourdes de France? And then the answer is to Saint Bernadette Suburius. And if you just search it in the text, we'll see that this is indeed how it happens. So the Virgin Mary reputedly appeared to Saint Bernadette Suburius. And then the label basically says where the answers should start. And you can validate that it indeed, you know, the, uh, we can validate that indeed, you know, if we index into this example in the text here, the Saint Bernadette Suburius is the beginning of that. Um, it only contains answer start, so you are supposed to get the end by just adding the length of this string. Um, next up, we initialize the tokenizer. Um, so the model will be called bird based cased. This auto tokenizer auto means that we're not explicitly specifying the class because the bunch of different tokenizers like um, sentence pair, word piece, um, byte pair encoding, BPE, and so on. Um, so by using the author word here, we basically say that, you know, we provide just the model name, bird base case, and uh, the model has like a card in hugging face, you can look it up, what exactly that is, how it was pre-trained, and so on. And then it will automatically decide which tokenizer will be correct for that model. Uh, so it's quite cool. We can see that the vocabulary size is roughly 30K here. Uh, and here's how I test uh, tokenizers usually. So um, I have some text here. Um, I add some spaces. I add some Chinese character characters. Uh, we know that it's cased, meaning that it does distinguish between big and small letters. Um, calling the tokenizer returns just the token IDs, um, just integer numbers. And here's how we can print out content of every individual token and then try to 
create the text from the tokens. So basically we took the text, encoded that into token, and then decoded back to text again. And here's how we compare like uh, what, what was lost during that encoding decoding. So we can see that, um, you know, we added CLS token. Um, most of the words basically correspond to tokens, except the unicorns. So unicorns, I suppose, is rare enough. So it was split across three tokens. It, and you can tell that this is not the next word, but continuation of the previous word by this prepended um, double digit uh, sign. Um, here's what we get as an output after decoding. So we added CLS token, we lost all the spaces. So, you know, this model, this particular tokenizer will not be that good at uh, reading, understanding Python code, for example. Chinese was completely lost. So we just basically replaced that by two unknown tokens, which means that the model does see that, you know, there's some Chinese character there or something unknown there, uh, but it doesn't really know what it is. Um, and so, you know, it doesn't really know what this says. Um, right. So the next problem we need to deal with is that the maximum sequence length of the model is limited. Uh, so it, for, for this particular bird, it's something like 400. Um, and so we need to decide like, how do we pass the text into the model? The text itself from the context of the question might be quite long and sometimes it will not fit into the uh, context, into the sequence length. So we need to deal with that somehow. Uh, so first of all, we're actually passing two strings here. So first is the question, and second one is the context, the text from where we need to extract the answer. Uh, and it's quite convenient in, in this trans um, tokenizer lib, where you just pass in two arguments, and then it will know that this is like segment number one, this is segment number two, it will automatically insert this separation token. Right. Uh, it's actually really important to know how to deal with this, you know, text not fitting into the sequence length of the model, because you see it in pretty much every NLP task that involves like fine tuning of birds or something like that. So that includes rags, retrieval augmented generation, search, um, you know, semantic analysis of texts and so on. Uh, so here we deal with that in the following way. So we have potentially large piece of text but the actual answer is probably quite small uh, as well as the question, uh, but we don't know where it is. So what we do is we split this text into smaller chunks and we split that with some stride, meaning that instead of just splitting into two non-intersecting parts, for example, we just slide this window. Um, that basically lets us make sure that if some word or some sentence was split in two uh, by this um, split operation, we also have the uh, window that also actually um, gets all of it, uh, which basically helps you, you know, always for, for every specific um, word in a text, you would always have the window that contains that word and some context left and right of that, um, which might be useful to actually understand what's going on. Uh, so the max length controls how big chunk of text we're allowed to pass to the model. We have the truncation. So here we have, we pass in two arguments, so the question and the text. And here we say that uh, we're only going to truncate the second one because we assume that the question is small enough. Um, finally, uh, we need to return overflowing tokens, which means that, you know, if our maximum length is 40 and the text is actually 200, uh, by setting this to true, we'll basically provide this striding operation and output something like five examples out of this uh, or six, depending on the stride, uh, instead of just cutting uh, out the first 40 and then throwing away everything else. Uh, this offsets mapping thing is needed if we have a batch of examples. So again, like in this case, we had one original um, text and it got split into two chunks. Uh, but in some cases, like here, for example, where we have more text, right? Um, we have a bad batch of four examples, right? And so we can see that, again, these examples were quite big. Uh, 
Um, and so four examples actually got expanded into 19 chunks, which means that now we need to connect the output chunk to the input example somehow, because we have four of them in the batch. And here is where this uh, offset mapping comes in. So it basically says that in here we have four initial examples. The first four chunks belong to the first example, then four, then four, and then the last example was the largest with the last six chunks belonging to that one. Basically offsets mapping allow us to actually map the output we got from the tokenizer to the original input example in a batch. And then we also have padding. So again, uh, our board will expect input of equal length, which means that sometimes the text is larger. So we cut, cut it into chunks with stride and so on, but sometimes it might actually be smaller. And in that case, we just add a special pad token uh, to let the transformer know that it's actually just padding, not some useful text. So here is how the example of that will look like. Here we just have token IDs. Um, this is what happens when we decode that. So we had a question and a long text. And in this specific case, it got split up into two chunks. Uh, the question is always the same. This is where we have this only second truncation. That is to say that, you know, you always append the first text to the chunk of the second text. Uh, we've seen that the sub token was added here. And then we also can check that we do have some strides. So this piece of text and ends in the ends mountains. And here we basically have this continuation of the send one, just to make sure that we got enough context to the left and to the right to actually answer the, the question that we had. Um, and so the output of that will be input IDs, which are the actual tokens, token type IDs. So token type IDs are basically segment IDs, right? So here we just have two of them. So the first one corresponds to the question and it has ID one, uh, ID zero, sorry. And the second one corresponds to the text itself and has token type ID of one. So token type IDs basically um, increment every time you meet a SAP token. Then we have attention mask, which basically tells us which part of the input is padding and which one is normal text. You have this offset mapping. Uh, so there is, this is another interesting one, right? So in the very beginning, we had the answer that just says that, you know, start at 515 uh, and then count the actual length of the answer. But all of this deals with initial characters, the actual letters in, in the Python string. Um, after tokenization, uh, all tokenizers can be different. So you you basically lose this mapping, right? So what you need is you need to somehow map token sizes and the indices in the original Python string. Um, and you need to map the offsets of the tokens you got into the uh, original string. So we can see how it looks like, right? We had the text, here is a question, sep in a shocking and so on and so forth. So first we had the CLS token, which is zero size. So the offset mapping says that it was zero size. Then we have the word here and it spans um, this token number two spans characters from zero to four. And then the word is that spans the character from five to seven and so on. So this mapping basically allows us to map the ground truth that dealt with characters into the tokens. Um, it might happen that, you know, the token is so big that, you know, it covers more than the answer. Um, it might happen. And in this case, we basically will deal with that in code. We'll say that the model is completely unable to find the answer in this case, simply because the um, tokenizer was too crude. And so we just, you know, uh, say that there is no answer here. So now we have our logic. We wrap our data set in basically we map our data set to tokenize and to do this chunking operation and so forth so the actual max length is 384 so quite a lot of text that we can fit in uh, to one sequence uh, in the transformer stride is 128 to make sure we have enough of context left and right of uh, potential answer that might come at every part of the chunk 
Um, so we basically wrap, uh, we write a function that takes in examples from the raw data set, which is texts and answers. Um, we have this pre-processing function that performs tokenization. And here we basically iterate over our offset mapping to convert offsets in the answer that um, deal with indices of characters to the indices of tokens. And here we can see that if, if we can find um, the proper aligned token and character, we basically append all zeros. So zero edX always corresponds to CLS token. So this is like saying that there is no answer. Uh, and then we just map the data set. So we have a row data set. We map that using our function. We patch that, um, remove all the old columns. We no longer need them. And this is what we get. So you can see here that uh, most of the examples did fit, but we did see, we do see some increase in size here, which come from the fact that some of the texts were chunked into several chunks and uh, the actual number of examples we got is now bigger. Uh, we can just index into this data set uh, using the slicing operation and we'll get the actual patch out of that. Um, so it has an IDs, token IDs, start positions, end positions. These are all now uh, in uh, token space. Uh, so this is the token of the start, token of the end, and so on. And we do roughly the same for validation examples. The logic will be slightly different. So for training, you have a large text. We split it into four examples, and we basically have four training examples. Now, for validation, we need to match the format of how everyone else um, evaluates the metrics. And that is always just one metric per example. So instead of doing these four independent examples, we want to basically iterate over all chunks and then find out the one uh, with the highest uh, pr predicted probability and then ch choose that one as, as our answer. So the data set itself is still bigger, but then we'll have to iterate over that and collapse when we uh, compute the metrics. So we define our model. So model checkpoint here is still our bird base uncased. Um, again, I'm using, using auto model uh, to say that, you know, it could have been bird, it couldn't be in something else like GPT-2 or something else. Uh, I just let it decide on the actual class based on the checkpoint. And I think we can see the class of the model like this. So it is now bird for question answering. And question answering here refers to these extra layers on top of the transformer that actually project the um, token output into probabilities of start and end token. Um, this is how we can cook the actual um, input example and just try and apply the model. So I just have some example text, uh, I have a question, I have text, max length regression, all of that. Then I add this return tensors uh, option so that the example actually contains tensor of IDs, not just an ID. And then I can just apply the model. And this is what I get out. So um, I had 40 tokens as input, and I have 40 outputs for start probabilities and 40 outputs for end probabilities. So when, um, when we will actually get out the result, and obviously we haven't really trained um, the prediction heads, we just have the pre-trained transformer. So these are pretty much random. But once we do the fine tuning, we'll see that, you know, whichever is maximum here is in this one will be chosen as the start and whichever is the maximum end one, uh, this one will be chosen as the end. And this is how we basically create our answer. So this is how an actual example from the training data set looks like. Uh, it has input IDs, token type IDs, attention mask, start positions and positions. Uh, the actual training is pretty straightforward. So the transformers library from Hagen Face has this training arguments class and trainer. And then we just call trainer.train. So all the complexity of training is actually hidden behind this trainer and training arguments. So for really complicated models with like learning rate scheduling, warm up with some different gradient clipping techniques, all of that. All of that is basically written inside the trainer already, and we just need to specify arguments. So right now we're just saying that, yeah, we 
We have fixed learning rate, trained for three epochs. We have some weight decay. We use 14 points of size 16, so just two bytes per 14 points. Uh, and we can see that it trains. So um, I'm going to interrupt it because we're not here to actually find the needle through the end. Instead, we're focusing on just reading the code. Um, and I want to dig into the code of the bird itself. To do that, we'll need to set up some breakpoints. Uh, now, first, we'll need to find the code for the actual model. So the class of the model is this bird for question answering. And then we, we can just find it in text search like this. Um, and you can see there's exactly one file in, in the repository that contains this modeling bird. Uh, so yeah, um, I actually didn't talk about that, but um, I've the way I work, uh, so I have my sandbox to Python net notebook. I've actually checked out the Transformers repository from Hugging Face. I've put the Jupyter Notebook right at the root of the repository and also installed the uh, Transformers library itself using pip install minus e, um, which basically installs it from, from this very repository. So Transformers itself is very widely used library. But thanks to this method of installation, I'm actually able to just read the code right in my VS code, um, which is quite useful. So yeah, uh, I have this bird for question answering. Here it is, initialize forward method. Let me just put um, a breakpoint in, in the very beginning of the forward method. And let's try to restart the training and see what we have. So it's right where we expect it to, right? We can validate what sort of input we get. Input IDs, the shape of that, the batch size is eight, sequence length is 384. We have our attention masks, which start with ones and with zeros, again, just as we expected. Token type IDs, mostly zeros, but sometimes should be one. Let's check that. Sometimes one, what else? Position IDs shouldn't be really, really be there. Okay, uh, so a few words about the code itself if, before we dig in. So you can see some different classes for bird. So this one is bird for question answering. If we scroll around, we'll see bird for token classification, bird for multiple choice, and so on and so forth. So this code is quite well written. Um, it's all basically split in different classes. Um, so it will have the base class itself for the bird, which is just called bird model, which contains the transformer, the encoding parts, and, and so on. And then different fine-tuning variations of that that might require projecting down to start and end of the answer or projecting down to token classification or projecting down to classification of an entire segment and so on. Those different architecture are defined as um, various classes. Um, and we can also see that, for example, the, like if we go to the BERT model itself, the embedding part is a separate class, encoder is a separate class and so on and so forth. Um, a lot of this code that we are about to read um, is basically runtime not that interesting because there is a lot of like if conditions that um, speed up the calculation in some cases or um, simplify it in some cases and so on and so forth. So a lot of these we'll actually just skip because they're not really doing anything um, that useful for us. So I'm back in my word for question answering, uh, the forward method. So you can see here that, you know, this line is not really doing much, uh, right? Because return dict is done. Um, so briefly, it will look like this. So most of the logic will be inside this bird module, which is defined as bird model. So this is the actual transformer. Um, we get sequence output out of that. Then we project that down to logits of start and end uh, probabilities. Then we also receive 
uh, in case of training uh, ground truth as an input and they are passed here as start positions and end position let's just validate that so th these are the correct answers for every start position and every end position um, down below here we see the actual call to cross, cross entropy loss so this is part of the model call in case we do have ground truth uh, we're going to basically compute the loss um, so let's start by just reading the code of BERT. So I'm digging into here. I can see that BERT now contains BERT embeddings, BERT encoder, and possibly, but um, probably not, BERT puller. Um, again, this one has forward method. This is all just boilerplate, not really doing anything interesting. The interesting part starts here. So I had my input IDs, position IDs, token type IDs. Um, I project that to embeddings of tokens using self.embeddings, and then I pass that into self.encoder. So positional embedding, segment embedding, and the actual token embedding all come from here. So let's try to dig further and actually take a look at that. Uh, so an Android module, um, we immediately see that these three embeddings are just an end dot embedding. So basically a trainable matrix of parameters. Um, and we have embeddings for words. That is, taking an actual token, a word, or piece of word, and projecting down to embedding. We have positional embeddings, something like 512 of them for every possible position. And then we have token type embeddings. So let's break at, at the very beginning of this one and see what happens. So first of all, let's print out the shapes for these. So tokenizer had something like 30k tokens, uh, and then hidden size is 768 uh, everywhere. Uh, then for position embeddings, 512, uh, so this is like the maximum sequence length that we allow to pass into the model. So our training code actually uses maximum sequence length of 384. Um, so we're not really going to use all of the available tokens. Um, but yeah, the model itself allows up to 512. Uh, and then the token type embeddings, It just has two embeddings. So one for token type zero, the question, and one for token type one, the text. Um, so let's see where the interesting stuff happens. So we project input IDs using word embeddings. So let's just scroll further down to here. Um, so input IDs are the actual IDs of tokens. And then after applying this word embedding, I get the actual embeddings out. The shape of that is eight. That's the batch size by 384. That's the number of tokens we had in the sequence input and the hidden size. Then we do the same stuff with token type embeddings, but now we feed in the token type IDs, which are just zeros and ones, I believe. And then we use uh, positional embeddings. We can validate that the thing is indeed absolute. So we, I do the same with position embedding and position IDs is just basically numbers from zero to 283. Uh, and then as we can see, all of that is just added together. So I had my tokens, token IDs, projected that down using word embeddings I had my token type IDs, which are zeros and ones, depending on the segment. And I had my position embeddings. All of these were just learnable vectors. And I just sum all of them out. And then I apply layer norm and drop out. So this is the end of bird embeddings. So basically by now, like um, we've we had token IDs and as input. And that also included CLS token and the SAP token. Uh, we have token type IDs, which basically already use the SEP token underneath. We used all of that to look up actual word embeddings. 
uh, segment embeddings and position embeddings, add it all, it all up, uh, and then the output, the final output, let's scroll a little bit to that. Um, after lay norm, after dropout, uh, would be the actual um, embeddings that we pass into the transformer. The shape of that is 8, the batch size 384, the uh, sequence length 768, the hidden dimension. So from then on, we will not deal with tokens anymore, just with the actual embeddings. Um, so let's read further. So we were reading the class BERT embeddings. Let's come back to BERT model. So you can see in the forward method that, um, where were we? Where were here? So we call the self.embeddings, and then the next call is self.encoder. And then after that, we pretty much output the result. It's just that every class or subclass of BERT has separate class defined for the output. I guess this is the typing thing to make sure we or always use correct classes. Uh, so let me read the code for encoder now. Um, so a lot of these classes are not really that interesting. Uh, so this one, although it does seem to have a lot of code, uh, you know, like return dict, hidden states, some caching. Uh, the only thing that it actually does is this um, iteration over all the layers. So we have 12 layers, we iterate over all of them and just call the actual layer. Um, and the layer is the BERT layer. And the BERT layer, again, doesn't seem to be doing much. So like, I don't know, this apply chunking to forward, for example, is a memory optimization. But the main logic is in this self.attention. Um, so let me just click to that. And again, uh, you might think that this is it, but not. But no, it's not doing much. Um, this is why it's quite useful to uh, run stuff in the debugger because by just iterating line by line, we can actually see that you know most of this is not executing or it's not really doing much. Um, so again, now the main logic should be in, in this part self attention, and this is where it starts. So here we have the actual query key and value projections and so on and so forth. So let's break at the very beginning of the forward and just continue here. So I'll just validate. So hidden states is the actual input. Uh, let's just validate that the shape of that is still the same, right? So exactly what we got out of embeddings after being passed down through four nested classes, uh, it's still all the same, uh, trust me. Uh, and then we do the actual multi-head attention. So um, again, here we see the code for code architecture, cross attention, this is not the case for BERT. BERT is simple, encoder-only, bidirectional attention. Um, and so we basically, we did the query projection here, and now we do key projection and value projection. And all of them are then uh, passed into this transpose for scores. And what this does is it basically takes the projection, which, uh, let's see the shape of that. It's the same, right? So you just projected it down to the same hidden dimension. Um, and it actually just reshapes the result, not really changing anything, uh, and takes the number of head, heads into account. So let's see how that looks like. So the key layer now has the shape of 8, the batch size, 12 number of heads, 384 number of sequence elements, and 64 is this new hidden size. So basically we had hidden size 768 that we split across 12 heads, uh, getting 64 um, numbers in every head. So this is how multi-head attention typically works. We, we have a big, long embedding. We split that into heads and then perform uh, attention independently for each head. And we do that for key, value, and query. Then we calculate the actual attention scores. So now the shape of that is 12, 384, 384. So um, you can view this matrix multiplication as an operation that collapses some dimensions. And so we had the last dimension of 768 for queries, 768 for keys. That got collapsed and then we got two sequence dimensions um, as an output. 
So basically now this attention matrix for each head, for each element in the batch, it will contain the attention weights between every element in a sequence. So effectively, it has the size of sequence squared. Um, main difference to GPT-2, for example, here will be in attention mask. So let's see how that is applied. So we actually do have attention mask here. And the shape of that is 8 by 1 by 1 by 384. Uh, so from there, you can also already understand that it is going to be bidirectional attention because attention mask is linear. So it's not square of sequence length, it's just linear, which is basically saying that, you know, every element in the sequence will have the exactly same attention mask, but we'll just cut off some piece from, from the very end because um, it was just padding. This is what this linear attention mask means. Uh, and we can sort of see how it looks like. Um, let's print out the first element. These dimensions are just empty and like the first 10 of them, for example, right? So attention mask of zero before the soft max basically means that we're not changing anything. And then if we look at the end of this one, it is minus infinity effective. So minus infinity, um, after being summed with the actual attention weights uh, and performing softmax basically turns these numbers into zeros. So this is our way of saying that, you know, zero those um, out. So we do softmax, drop out, um, and that's it. That's our attention probabilities as we get them output. Uh, and then we do another matrix multiplication to the value layer. And then the output of that should be basically our um, same shape as input. Um, and now we are ready to basically output that as part of our layer. Um, then we also reshape it, uh, perform permutations because that's what we did uh, before. And the final shape. Mm. Yep. So uh, after these reshapings and permutations, we basically now had 12 heads with 64 dimension in each head and we just concatenated it all together. Um, and you can notice that the output shape is now exactly the same as we had for input, right? So we performed our multi-head attention, calculated the attention weights, uh, performed the masking, which is just basically cutting out some padding from the end. But other than that, it allows every element in sequence to attend to every element, uh, every other element, including the ones to the left and to the right. Um, and we get our output. This was the BERT self-attention, uh, which was the part of BERT attention. So now we will move up um, and let's just validate like what else is happening here. So we got the attention output. So I'm up one layer to BERT attention. So I've just calculated the self-attention. Uh, yep, this is it. Um, then I perform another dense projection uh, using this self dot output. Let's just validate the type of that. This self dot output has the class of bird self output, which is another class. Uh, and here it has linear layer norm dropout. Uh, so when when we apply this, we get this hidden state as an input. We perform dense projection, dropout, and then this plus here is residual. Um, and then we return that. Now coming back to bird attention, uh, what, what is basically saying here, so this self, which stands for self-attention, compute the attention, but to make it into a proper transformer layer, we also have residual, dense, dense projection, then residual, and then layer norm. Um, and this is, this is the end of it, basically. Um, so let's just validate. So now the output, again, same shape as the input. Right, but now we've added dense layer and residual. BERT attention was part of BERT layer. 
Um, let's just validate that nothing unexpected happened here. So here was the call to self attention. Now we are here. So outputs basically contain the actual embedding and attention matrix. So attention matrix is really needed for some extra computations not really used for primary inference, uh, which is why we select this first element from the tuple. So this indexing here is not saying that we're taking just the first token. No, it is just the shape transformation because we added attention weights as an extra output for uh, basically just an as extra information. And now we take the um, actual embedding output uh, as the first element. So the shape of this attention output is, again, the same as input. Now, the last tiny thing I want to read regarding the inference is the loss. So let's come back to the BERT for question answering, our original model that we were reading. So um, we're reading this self.BERT call, which is basically all related to the transformer. So let's just break right after that. Um, we can validate that sequence output is basically all the tokens out. So despite this indexing by zero, this is basically indexing within a tuple that contains the output and some meta information. It's not taking the first token, for example. So we get all tokens out, all 384 of them. And then we have this QA outputs, which is just a, I assume, a linear layer. Yep, just a linear layer. We project that down to logits. So logits, what is that? Um, they have shape of eight, batch size 384, the sequence length by two. So now every token has two predictions, two logit predictions for that token, the probability of that token being the start of the answer and the end of the answer. Um, and then we have the ground truth. So the start positions and end positions are the, the real answers that we have to the question. Um, and there's just eight of them. So one number per example in the batch for start positions and the same for end positions. So those, thanks to our uh, data set transformation code, those were already remapped from initial character level to token level. Um, and then we have this cross entropy loss. So we have this ignore logic here, which basically makes sure that if for some reason, maybe because of the mistake in our data set code, we had token index that is actually outside of our sequence, we just ignore that and don't count that in the loss. Um, and now the logits have the shape of eight by 384. Uh, and start positions, just eight. So I'm basically matching my 394 tokens uh, with one start position prediction for each of them to the actual indices of correct matching. So these start positions uh, will have indices, like for each batch, they will have correct index. And so if, if we guess correctly, we get the positive feedback. If we didn't, we get negative feedback. So basically this probability predictions will increase, will be trained to increase for the one token that is supposed to be start and then decrease for everything else. Uh, and the same for end. And I just sum up start loss plus end loss. So we've looked at the fine tuning code, the code for BERT inference itself, all the way down to multi-head attention. Uh, the last interesting thing I wanted to show is the actual mask language modeling for the train example. So let's deal with that. The example for mask language modeling is actually located in, in the same hugging face transformers uh, library. Uh, and it's located in quite a nice way, like examples slash PyTorch slash language modeling slash run MLM. Uh, so um, pretty straightforward. In the same folder, they have a bunch of other examples like the causal modeling um, that was used in GPT-2 uh, fill in the middle, FIM, uh, permutation modeling, all of that. So it's quite a valuable source of information. Uh, they also have a readme on how to actually run that. So in that, they have an example command on how to run it to make it actually work. So we are interested in debugging. So I basically copy this um, command line arguments and 
paste them directly to uh, VS Code launch.json, which allows me to launch debugger. So just copied all of that here in, in the args um, uh, of this launch. And then I just launch it with my debugger. Uh, and it should work. Um, there's quite a lot of code here. So um, I just want to stop on like the most important things. So let's just see what there are. So the, the code structure itself is quite similar to what we had in the um, in, in the Jupyter notebook. So we start with the data set and the first mention of the data set is this raw data set, which basically just loads the text as it is. Um, and I set the first breakpoint here. Then we have to tokenize it. And so somewhere here, um, we have the tokenizer, which is again, just the one appropriate for our model, which is the same. Um, and then we have the tokenize function. So we apply that, uh, create the tokenized data set. Um, so I put the next breakpoint right below that so that we can read like what did we get out of this tokenization. Um, but again, this text might be really large. It might not fit in the context window of our model. So another thing that will be happening here is grouping. Um, actually, yeah, here it is, which basically splits the text into chunks. Um, and we do that after tokenization, of course, because uh, the context uh, length is always in, in tokens. So we'll have the next data sets, um, which is basically apply the map here to, to do the grouping. Uh, finally, there is this data collator for language modeling, uh, which is responsible for masking uh, the language tokens. So you can see how it looks like. Um, it's, it's a Python class that has methods for doing that for TensorFlow for PyTorch, um, and I believe also JAX. Um, we are interested in the one for PyTorch. So I set the breakpoint at the very beginning of the torch call. Um, and then everything else will be happening within the trainer, which is again, the same trainer. So we can check out which arguments are used and so on. Um, but we also want to, to see how the loss is computed. So I'm coming back to my modeling bird, and we know that it should have a class for BERT for masked language modeling. And here it is. And I just, again, set the breakpoint at the very beginning of the forward call. So this should be it. And we just quickly look through all the breakpoints and let me launch this. So it will take some time for it to load and to actually load the data set. Um, hopefully we'll skip it up. Uh, right now we have the data set. So raw data set is just pure text, no tokenization, no grouping. Uh, I can access the train part of that and then the actual element. Um, and the first one is empty for some reason. Then we have some text, then empty again, then again some text. This is like uh, parts of Wikipedia articles. Um, and this is what, what we find, what we pre-train on in this case. So let's move on to the next one. Now we have the tokenized data set. So again, we can access the actual examples by subsetting it to train and then the first one. And now the first one has tokens. So we also have token type IDs, which are always zero in this case, because we're not using next sentence prediction um, at least here in this code, although I do believe that the original bird trained on mask language and next sentence prediction all at once. Um, then we have attention mask, which is always once because uh, we're not batching the data yet. Once we start batching, we'll add the attention mask as well. So let's move forward. We are now in this data collator that is supposed to perform the actual masking. So let's check out how input IDs look like. Just a bunch of IDs. The length of that is now, this is after grouping. So we already get like all everything, uh, uh, like huge chunk of text uh, from concatenation of several texts. We might need to do some padding. 
and then we call this torch mask tokens function. So let me put the breakpoint here and see what happens here. Uh, so first of all, we had inputs, which are our token IDs in this case. Uh, for mask language modeling, we are going to have some labels. And labels here are just exact copy of inputs. So unlike GPT-2, for example, we are not doing this right shift where we ask the token to predict next token. Instead, we'll be masking some of them, and then we'll ask the model to, uh, have it, having the mask token as an input, to restore that to original token. So um, we initialize the probabilities. Uh, we have our self MLM probability to say which tokens we're going to mask, and we mask 15% of tokens. Um, then this one basically looks for special tokens in the input text because we might have CLS tokens, we might have uh, separation tokens, SEP tokens, and stuff like that. Those are not the ones we're going to mask, so we need to know which of them are special. And then we basically make sure that we, we're not going to assign any probabilities to that. Uh, then we actually compute which indices we want to replace. Uh, and for those indices, uh, sorry, for, for the indices that we are not replacing, we are setting the label to minus 100. It's actually the same label as is used for, uh, sorry, the same token ID as is used for padding. Um, and if we look at PyTorch's definition of cross entropy loss, by default, it uh, has this ignore index parameter, which is also minus 100 which is basically ignored in the loss. So here we're saying that, you know, we had our labels, which before that was exact copy of input tokens. And now most of them, like 85% of them will be minus hundreds because we're not really interested in what's happening there. And some of them will be just original tokens. And we want the model to restore original tokens. Um, so then we have the actual noise um, and like in, in different cases, we do different stuff. So we are going to consider 15% of overall tokens. 80% of those we will just replace with like the proper mask token. And you can see how it looks like. It's, it looks like this mask. Then in 10% in of the cases, uh, we instead just flip these tokens to random tokens. Let's see how that looks like. Just some random token IDs. Um, and then in, in the rest, 10% not really dealt with here, but it, it is implicit. We uh, basically just leave them at, as they are. Basically asking the model to restore the token knowing the original token. So now we continue. Uh, and basically this is it. So we had raw text. We tokenized that. We grouped that into the actual um, chunks with exactly the same length as we need uh, for the model input. Then we masked some tokens. And now we should be ready to actually apply BERT and compute the loss. So I'm continuing forward and I'm, I've stopped in this BERT for masked LM. Uh, again, here I call the BERT, which is the model that we've already seen before of type just BERT model. This is like the base that is used in different uh, variations of the bird, like for language modeling, for question answering, and so on. Uh, so again, I continue until here. And this indexing is just taking out the actual full token output out of this meta structure. So the shape of that is batch size by sequence length by hidden size. So we are not really indexing into the first token here. Uh, then we compute prediction scores. So self.cls is just a tense layer. Um, actually, it's not. It's BERT only LM head. Let's read what that is. Um, that has BERT LM predictions head. Okay. Uh, BERT LM predictions head transform, linear, and bias. So bias is just learnable parameter. Linear is just one linear layer. Let's just actually output what it says here. Right. So I think this is this is uh, clearer now. So we have linear layer, 
um, generalized linear activation, layer norm, and then another um, linear. So, but yeah, it, it basically projects the embedding dimension of the transformer output to the probability predictions for every token. And then we have labels. So labels is exactly the same object we got from our data collector with 85% of indices actually ignored and then the rest of them corresponding to original tokens that we had in the text before masking. And then we just compute cross-entropy loss. So this is it.